Hello, uh, this is uh, Adam Schwartz with uh, Columinate. Uh, we have a few uh, attendees, uh, Astrid and Owen. Uh, just want to make sure that you can hear me. I have clicked on allowing you to talk. Uh, and see Wendy has joined us as well. Uh, if you want to unmute yourselves uh, and say hello, you're welcome to do so. Hi, everyone. This is Owen from Port Townsend. Okay. Hi, Owen. Welcome. And Owen, can you see um, the screen with the PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. And uh, uh, Astrid and Wendy, if you want to say hi, you can. If not, that's okay, too. You're not uh, required to. Uh, and uh, welcome. So uh, uh, I like to uh, create an on-time culture uh, in my workshops and in my uh, webinars and chat webinars. So uh, we're going to get started. And uh, at any point, if you have some questions, uh, please uh, feel free uh, to speak up or to uh, via the, the chat box that I will um, check as well. So whatever works uh, best uh, for you. Uh, you're going to see uh, a couple of different images uh, coming by uh, as, I, as I talk. And I, I give a fair number of, of presentations about the, the cooperative business model. And I'm always looking for new ways to, to talk about it. And uh, one of the things I, I came upon was uh, thinking about, uh, you know, things in nature. Uh, and uh, fish swim in schools. Uh, animals roam in herds, and birds fly in flocks. Uh, what is it that humans do? Uh, we form cooperatives, and uh, we do so for the same reason our furry, feathered, and scaly friends do, uh, because it offers us uh, protection, uh, efficiency, uh, and benefits. Uh, and it's just more fun to, to work uh, together. Uh, and I am so fortunate I get to work with uh, co-ops in all different sectors. Uh, and uh, you see no matter uh, where we are uh, that this business model works. So I'm just going to share a little bit of some of the insights that I have picked up uh, over my 28 years now with co-ops and uh, welcome uh, your reaction. Uh, to them, this uh, whole slide deck uh, is available to anyone uh, if they want uh, afterwards. Happy to share it. One of the things I say these days is uh, uh, plagiarism is defined as stealing one person's idea. If you steal a lot of people's ideas, uh, it's called research. So uh, everything in this uh, presentation is uh, well researched. I'm a big fan of quotes, and uh, this is one of my favorites uh, from Helen Keller. And I think really at its essence really describes what a, what a co-op is, is all about. Uh, it's uh, people coming together uh, to do something that they probably could not do uh, on their own. So whether it's the, it was the lack of organic and local foods in the 60s and 70s and even earlier than that for some coming together uh, for electric co-ops in rural areas. Uh, Investor-owned businesses did not want to bring electricity there, so they came together. Credit unions, because big banks would not uh, bring them credit. Uh, so it serves the individual's self-interest uh, while also serving the community interest as well. Uh, the way I like to say it is that uh, uh, co-ops answer the question of what's in it for me uh, with what's in it for we. Uh, that we, and we can we can do more. So uh, one of the things I, I like to ask, and uh, you can once again feel free to to speak up uh, or put it in the chat box, or you don't have to answer at all. Um, why you're choosing to spend 30 minutes of, of your time uh, here? Uh, the assumption is obviously that you want to help your co-op uh, grow and get bigger. If anyone wants to volunteer uh, something, that's great. That way I can. Uh, work to make sure that I cover it uh, in uh, in the presentation. Uh, but uh, as I say, if, if 
you just want to be in quiet mode and listen, that that's okay as well. Uh, whatever works best for you. All right. uh, but I will try and keep an eye on the on the chat box uh, as well. And I, I have made it available that everyone can speak if you, if you want to. Uh, so if there's something specific you want me to cover, uh, please uh, don't be shy uh, about asking. Uh, this is one of the definitions of, of culture that I, I like to use. Uh, another way of looking at it is it's what gets passed down uh, from either one generation uh, to the next that's not genetic uh, or what gets transferred uh, between uh, co-workers and colleagues. Right? Uh, sometimes you might have heard the expression, uh, well, we just that's not the way we do it around here or this is the way we do it around here. That creates a, a culture. And another way I think of, of describing culture in a business setting uh, is that culture is to an organization uh, what water is to a fish. It's uh, simply the environment uh, that we live in all the time. And they, whoever they is, uh, say that fish don't know that they live in water unless uh, one of two things happens. Um, they get a hook in their mouth and they're that are flopping on the deck, or the water becomes so toxic uh, that they can no longer breathe uh, in it. Uh, and certainly we never want the culture in, in our co-ops uh, to be so toxic uh, that people feel like the, that they can't breathe. One of the other things that, that tends to happen too is that um, when we, we tend to be with others, we tend to be with others that kind of look like us. And one of the great joys of my work is that I get to work with all different types of co-ops. So food co-ops, electric co-ops, credit unions, purchasing co-ops, ag co-ops, housing co-ops. Uh, and I get to see uh, what works in those different sectors. And, and like a bee that pollinates, I can take some of the good things from, from each sector and, and bring them together. So one of the things that I would you know, make a suggestion that you might look at, look at the other co-ops that are in your community uh, or that you have some connection to uh, and, you know, just have a conversation with them and ask them uh, how they use the, the co-op principles and values uh, going forward. Another common issue that you find in organizations is uh, the, the creation of silos. Uh, and I understand why they get formed. All right. There's, you know, different people, front end, back end, uh, you know, uh, different types of employees at different co-ops and, and silos to a certain extent make sense. It, but when they get in the way of the effectiveness of the organization and it becomes an us versus them kind of uh, attitude, then that's a, then that's a problem. And uh, so we want to certainly make sure no matter what your role is in the organization that you understand that we all work for this organization. And the way I, I phrase this is that uh, no one has a job interview that goes like this. We have a wonderful uh, job for you here at the co-op. Uh, it does absolutely nothing. Uh, we think you'd be very good at it, right? No one has that, that job interview. Everyone is hired for a purpose. And making sure that they understand what that purpose is, uh, is, is important, right? And that's how we can, you know, begin to build that cohesive culture where we're all coming together. So no matter what your role is, that we are um, all in this uh, together uh, going forward. Uh, and, you know, numerous studies have, have certainly shown the importance of culture uh, in an organization. And one of the things that I also suggest is that you just have conversations about it uh, and ask Ask people uh, if they were to describe the culture at your co-op to a, to a friend or family member, how would they describe it? What word would they use or words uh, so that you can get a bit of sense? And you can do this on a, a certainly more scientific basis uh, using, uh, you know, surveys. Uh, I know that uh, we have created uh, specific survey questions uh, to get at how well the co-op is living up to the, to the principles. So that might be something you know, that uh, you might investigate uh, in the future. Uh, 2012, as you may know, is the International Year of the Cooperative. Uh, this is a wonderful quote um, by Ban Ki-moon, the former general secretary, and I think it really does describe quite well what a, what a co-op is, is all about. Uh, that there is certainly the, the business aspect, but there is this social and community aspect. I'm currently involved uh, in my home community of uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, 
This is our mug uh, glass here, the Fredericksburg Food Co-op. We, we haven't opened our doors yet, uh, but we're uh, about 1,350 members strong. And seeing that real sense of community uh, that we're creating is, is, is great fun and a real pleasure to be part of it. Uh, uh, I like to run. Um, actually, to be more accurate, I like to eat. And, uh, and running helps support my eating habit. And uh, culture, to a certain extent, is is like running. Uh, it's something that we have to do on a regular basis if we want to get good at it. Uh, we have to be able to talk about it. Uh, and you never check the box and say, well, I'm done. I'm done exercising. All right? It's a lifelong uh, commitment uh, if you want to stay uh, healthy and in shape. Uh, and so is culture in our organization. Because every time you hire a new person or someone leaves the organization, that's an opportunity for the culture to spiral up or to spiral down, uh, depending on, on the, the person or persons who are leaving or coming. I, I think it's important that we understand some of the basics of the difference between our way of doing business and, and investor-owned. Right? Obviously, they're in it to make money. Uh, and we are, we're created uh, for the service or the good that we provide. Do we have to make money? Uh, absolutely. It's a, a critical part of our existence. Uh, and we would not be here to do all the good things uh, unless we made money. So uh, certainly uh, the business aspect is important, but that social aspect. And, and often I hear people say that, well, clubs are just different because it's in our DNA. Uh, well, the problem with that is no one sees your DNA. So we have to figure out a way of how to explain it and talk about this, this business model in a way that people can understand. Um, we have a rich history. Uh, this picture may look familiar to some. Uh, the original Rochdale pioneers uh, in uh, 1844, uh, and they gave us these uh, wonderful seven core principles. A couple that I like to point out are the Democratic member control, one man, one vote. Even though it says one man, uh, co-ops gave women the right to vote in uh, 1844, some 70 years before they had the right to vote here in the United States. I think that's a, a good part of our history and one worth highlighting. And this political and religious neutrality. And I, and I think that's an important part of, of who we are as well. I spent the good number of my years uh, as a lobbyist, um, about 25 years as a lobbyist and about 15 of them lobbying for co-ops. And uh, one of the sort of the light bulb days for me was when I lobbied Bernie Sanders. I think we all know who he is. And I lobbied uh, Jerry Moran, who's a conservative senator uh, from Kansas. And they both agreed with me about co-ops. So I hope that, that co-ops can be the place in our community where people, no matter what their political views are, can come together. Uh, we all want to eat good food, we want to breathe clean air, drink clean water. Uh, no matter where you are on the political spectrum, you might have elderly parents that need care or sick children. Uh, good schools are an issue, right? I mean, there are some basic human needs. And using the co-op as a place where people can come together uh, in safety and in harmony. Uh, even though we might have political differences, uh, but talking about the things that, that we want to see uh, in our community. Uh, and co-ops uh, operate in, in every part of the country. I do a fair amount of work with rural electric co-ops and telephone co-ops that serve rural America. Uh, you might be able to tell from my accent that I'm a native of the Deep South, uh, uh, South Brooklyn. And uh, so in uh, my hometown, New York City, uh, this picture is from uh, a number of co-ops, uh, housing co-ops that exist. And, and roughly three million people live in New York City, live in, live in housing uh, co-ops. So, uh, so now, whether you live in the most urban part of our country or in the most uh, rural part, uh, there's a, there's a co-op uh, for you. So a little game I like to play, uh, guess how many dots are, uh, are on the map uh, here. Uh, if, uh, if anyone uh, wanted to, uh, to type into the chat box a guess, you can do that or say it. Uh, I'll only give you a second to do that here. Um, and uh, well, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you, uh, it's, there's uh, 40,000 uh, uh, dots on that map. Uh, there's co-ops in every state uh, in, in the country, uh, in every congressional district, uh, and serving a, a wide variety of different needs. 
and we exist uh, not just in uh, the United States, but really all over the world. And uh, this island of Madagascar uh, in uh, off the coast of uh, Mozambique in South Africa, I spent three weeks there a few years ago uh, helping to start a, um, a farmer's co-op for vanilla farmers so that they can have the benefits of of uh, coming uh, together. Uh, uh, so, and some of these figures are probably a little bit inaccurate uh, now because co-ops continue to, to evolve and grow. Uh, and the, not every country does a great job of, uh, of studying uh, the exact number of co-ops. These are the, the four types of, of co-ops uh, that exist. Um, the food co-ops, of course, are consumer co-ops, as are electric uh, and uh, credit unions. Um, then you have producer co-ops, and some of the, the best known uh, uh, co-ops are, are come to us from the from the ag uh, space. Uh, and uh, Worker co-ops where the workers own the business and then purchasing shared service, of which Culminate is a shared services co-op, Ace Hardware purchasing co-op. And they really serve a, a, a great variety of, of different types of businesses. It's helping to explain to new employees the breadth of all these different types of co-ops and not just new employees, quite frankly, existing employees uh, as well. So that they really understand, uh, okay, uh, the benefit. Okay, thank you all for the guests. Okay, <laughs> all right. But there's 40,000 co-ops uh, in the United States. So just, you know, having conversations and opening people's minds to all the different types, I think is, is one of the things that we can do uh, to help people have a, have a good understanding of, of what it is. Uh, I call this my NASCAR slide of cooperation. Oh, the different, uh, once again, these different types. Uh, health Partners is a healthcare co-op that exists in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Um, Insure so about 1.2 million people, 10,000 employees. The doctors, the patients, and the administrators are all part of the co-op. The doctors get measured on how well the co-op, uh, how well the uh, co-op members, the, the patients, uh, do. It's kind of an interesting way of measuring healthcare. Uh, in this country, we really go by quantity healthcare. If your doctor gets a, a new MRI machine, chances are that there'll be more MRIs uh, get ordered because they need to, to pay for that machine. Uh, not suggesting anyone's doing anything unethical, but that's you know kind of what happens. Uh, REI, probably well known to everyone here. Uh, uh, about five years ago, they decided to close their doors on uh, the day after Thanksgiving uh, and told their employees to go take a hike, uh, and that proved to be a great, great benefit. Uh, and they said they could do so in part because they're a co-op and. Uh, uh, and they didn't have outside investors that they had to, um, uh, you know, answer to. Restaurant supply chain probably does not look familiar to you, but all of the franchise owners of Kentucky Fried Chicken and uh, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut uh, do not buy their product from those parent franchisors. They buy it from a co-op that they themselves uh, own and, and, and operate. Uh, so, uh, again, the co-op business model just showcasing uh, how varied it, it can be. And um, every credit union in the country is a, is a cooperative uh, as well. Of course, these seven co-op principles, I'm sure, are well known. Uh, lots of food co-ops do a good job of, of putting them in, uh, in their stores, painting them on the walls and things like that. But how do we live those? Uh, when it comes to voting, making making it as, as accessible for people so that they can vote at the annual meeting, vote by mail, and vote online, I think is is very helpful. Having a good understanding of what the what the economic participation is, whether it's the hundred, two hundred dollar equity payment to be a member, uh, whether it's the discounts that they get, or maybe a patronage rebate if your if your co op is profitable enough uh, to offer that. Making sure people understand that, making sure, of course, that the employees understand it so that uh, they can explain it uh, uh, to folks. Uh, principle four, autonomy and independence. Uh, the way I describe this is if, if you've seen one co-op, you've seen one co-op. Uh, 
Um, so this idea of making sure that, that we're doing things that are in our interest. But of course, one of those things that may be in your interest may be joining with other co-ops, like joining NCG. Right. Uh, so that's a, a particular benefit, uh, you know, that co-ops can, can decide for themselves. What we're doing right now, this idea of doing education, training and information so that people understand uh, what this co-op is all about. Uh, and that can be in five minute snippets or, you know, all day trainings, you know, whatever it makes, makes most sense. Cooperation among cooperatives. When I first started working for co-ops, this was my favorite principle because uh, it's the one I could remember the easiest. But this idea of getting co-ops to, to come together, and I'll offer an example of a couple of that in a, in a moment. Uh, clearly, in the food co-op space, come together and, and do certain things, whether it's a car by corridors or NCG or in other ways. But look at how we can partner with co-ops in other sectors as well. Uh, and making sure that we're supporting one another there. Uh, I say every co-op starts with concern for community. Um, so uh, in whatever it is that your mission and how you lay it out, making sure that people you know, really understand uh, uh, that. Uh, this, just a photo I took from Willie Street uh, Food Co-op in Madison. Uh, I have an awful handwriting, so I appreciate a really good handwriting. I just you know, the ways that we can showcase these principles. So, you know, doing what we can, you know, within our, within the store, any retail space uh, and wherever to make sure people really understand what these principles are about and what their origin is, and where they come from. And in addition to the principles, we have, you know, some wonderful values, but again, values on a nice PowerPoint or anywhere else yeah, isn't really going to matter unless we're living those values. So when you're, when your co-op is doing something, whether that's it's in concert and in uh, in harmony with the principles and with the values, calling that out um, to your employees and to your members that the reason why we do this is just that we're a co-op and we have these principles and values. So trying to build that connective tissue between the way you're acting uh, and what it means uh, to be a co-op. This next slide uh, comes to us from an organization called Cooperatives for a Better World, and that's the name of their website. I, I'd recommend checking that out as well. So this idea that we're going to take people on a path, and one of the ways I kind of, you know, showcase, you know, how we can do that is, is talking about the, the kinds of actions that individuals can take so that when they're shopping, not only shopping at a co-op, but looking to buy co-op products. Uh, within that. And to the extent that your co-op can identify uh, products, you know, through some shelf labeling or uh, in other ways that showcase which products are from a co-op, just a, another way of, of educating folks about this, this cooperative difference. And, uh, you know, having a, real, a direct relationship with a local credit union so that you can be in their field of membership uh, and uh, they can offer maybe financial counseling and assistance to employees and to members um, so people can understand, you know, the benefits of, of uh, having a, a good budget, things like that. So, you know, uh, just another one of my favorite, favorite quotes. Indeed, it's how sort of every co-op gets started uh, as a group of dedicated and committed people. And what we hope is that over time uh, that, you know, the co-op stays true to, the, to those principles and does things to reinvigorate uh, the sense of mission and purpose. Uh, and as the competitive landscape gets more intense, uh, you know, that's truly one of our differentiators uh, from, uh, from the competitors is that we're a co-op. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Whole Foods and others are not in, in showcasing that and why that matters. Uh, my assumption is, because given my work with, with hundreds of co-ops over the years, uh, everyone has a mission statement. I urge you to think about what your mission statement sta statement sta says, and would your employees and would your board and, and would some of your members know what that mission is? The mission statement for the, the cooperative way, which is my business that's part of Culminate, is um, to help co-ops succeed. Uh, I like it because it's succinct uh, and I can remember it. Um, there's a, another co-op I'm doing some work with and their mission statement is uh, to do what others refuse to do, right? uh, which I think is 
kind of cool and empowering. So thinking about what your mission statement is and does it sing uh, to people? Because ultimately what we want is for everyone to be uh, a co-op ambassador for all of your employees uh, and hopefully your members as well to, to really take on what it means to be part of a co-op uh, and, and showcase that. These are some books that uh, all mention co-ops to varying degrees, some exclusively like Co-op Solution and Humanizing the Economy. Uh, the local dollars, local sense of local vesting have, have really good chapters on co-ops. So there's, you know, all the things that we can be doing to, to learn about co-ops uh, going forward. I think that, you know, helps us make some sense. I love this. Uh, this mirror comes to us from a credit union in, uh, in North Carolina. Uh, if you look closely, it says state employees, credit union, meet SECU's owners. You're looking good. Uh, and just the idea, just showcasing uh, who it is. Food co-ops could certainly do this as well and maybe put a little rack card here. If you're not a member, how you would become a member. Uh, uh, just little things that we can do that just, you know, constantly the drip, drip effect. So people understand what this co-op is, is all about. Love this uh, slide. Uh, this is uh, two co-ops uh, here in Virginia, a credit union and a uh, food and a um, electric co-op that have come together uh, to do good work in their community and offer financial counseling to the employees and members. Uh, so just a, a really nice way of showcasing. And I know that a lot of food co-ops have ATMs from, from credit unions. You might think about um, the screensaver that's on that ATM, something talking about how we're both co-ops well, working, working together. So another great story. This is an electric co-op that borrowed money um, from the federal government through a program that they have, the Red Lake program, uh, and lent it uh, to folks in, uh, in Fairbanks to start a food co-op. So there's, you know, um, opportunity, financial opportunities uh, to partner uh, as well. Uh, so uh, I think co-ops are a very cool business model. Uh, we were local before that was a thing. We know locals sells because Walmart is, is trying to tout that they're local as well. Uh, the difference is, is that we're the real deal uh, and we don't have to fake it. B Corps, the beneficial corporations uh, are out there. Uh, that's relatively recent, past 20 years, trying to create a more ethical business. We already have one. It's co-ops and we were there. And if you look at um, uh, Indie uh, 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 Kickstarter or Indiegogo, uh, these crowdfunding sites, well, guess what? Co-ops were the leaders in crowdfunding. That's how we all got started, uh, was asking our members uh, for money. I'm on a personal mission um, to uh, have a good co-op license plate in, in every state. Um, so if your state is not listed here, um, we also have Iowa's. So, but if your state's not there and you get one, uh, please take a picture of it and send it to me and I will send you a gift card to REI. Once we get all 50 states, we'll be on CNN or something and tell folks how good uh, co-ops are. So, um, I spoke of, about the different types of co-ops, just a little summary, there you see some more. Um, there are childcare co-ops and there are funeral co-ops. So literally from, uh, from cradle to grave, you can have a, a whole co-op uh, existence. Um, and so uh, that concludes you know, my presentation. It looks like I ended uh, two minutes early. Uh, so uh, I thank you so much for your attention. I say the microphones are open. The chat box is open. If you have any questions, I certainly have a few more minutes um, to hang around uh, for, for any discussion uh, and, and welcome your feedback or questions. Or if you've got other things to do, um, I certainly understand that as well. Um, I thank you for, for participating and being part of this, and uh, I hope it was helpful.